We're particularly delighted to welcome to this pulpit this morning the Reverend Dr. John Claypool, who is well known to so many of you from his preaching and teaching and from the many books that he has written. And some of you will remember that he was our Focus Weekend preacher here in 1994. And our session in Christian Education Council and all the leaders of this church were absolutely joyful when we found out that Dr. Claypool was going to be able to return today, this weekend. And of course, no one had any idea about the tragic events that would have transpired before this weekend. Dr. Claypool called and said that if I wanted to preach today, he would be glad to step aside and allow me that privilege. And I said to him, and I say it to him again in front of all of you, John, there isn't anyone in America that I would rather have standing in this pulpit today than you. John Claypool, as you are aware, was the rector of the St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Birmingham, Alabama for 13 years before going into what I think can best be called semi-retirement because he is still very active preaching and teaching in many places and serving as the theologian in residence of the Trinity Episcopal Church in New Orleans, Louisiana, where he and his lovely wife, Anne, reside. Anne is here sitting with the Parkers and the Ellises, and Anne, we are so glad that you were able to be with John and with all of us on this Focus Weekend. We'll see more, I hope, of John and Anne in the days and months ahead because John has also been named recently the visiting professor of homiletics at the McAfee School of Theology of Mercer University. And we're hoping and praying that that means that our friendship will be strengthened in the days and years that are yet to come. Following this worship service, there will be a luncheon for the officers and staff of this church with the Claypools, and we hope that all of you will be in attendance. In houses of worship across this nation today, people of faith are gathering to lift up their prayers to God, seeking the help and the healing and the hope which all of us need. This past week, more than 3,000 people came to worship services here on Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, and Friday afternoon. And we continue to pray for those who have lost their lives, for those who have lost their loved ones, for those who are still missing, for those courageous rescue workers, and for our leaders, for our president, elected leaders in Washington, and our military leaders, praying that God will grant them the wisdom and the resolve which they need to lead us as a nation in this traumatic and tragic time. Unlike many of us in this part of the world, Frederick Beatner did not grow up in a church-going family. His parents were socially prominent, highly educated New Yorkers for whom religion simply was not of interest. And therefore, he was not given any spiritual resource on which to turn when life began to work him over as it works us all over if we live very long. In fact, his childhood innocence came to a shattering end one Saturday morning when he was 10 years old. His father got up before anybody else in the family, went down in the garage and carefully closed the door, turned on the ignition of the old Chevrolet, sat down on the running board, and was asphyxiated before anybody in the family realized what was happening. The older Bigner had been a promising young adult, an honor graduate of Princeton. Everyone expected him to follow in the tradition of his achieving family. But the Great Depression came just as he was getting established professionally. Because of that, he could never get and keep the kind of jobs that he wanted to provide for his family. And unfortunately, he began to rely on alcohol to cover his disappointment, which only exacerbated the difficulty. And because he had no spiritual resources on which to rely, it got to the place that he felt the only way out was that dark exit called suicide. And so he bolted through it. Years later, when people would ask Frederick how his father died, he would always say he died of heart trouble. And then he said this was partially true. You see, he had a heart, and it was troubled. <laughs> 
And at the depths of that trouble was the absence of hope. He had nothing on which to rely when life worked him over. Young Beatner went on living much as his family had. He was sent to the Lawrenceville School in New Jersey for his prep school days. Went to Princeton as his father had gone before him. That was interrupted by World War II, but he went back after the war. Finished at Princeton, and then he was invited to come back to his alma mater to Lawrenceville to be a junior teacher of English. Many of his old professors were still there, and he wondered what it was going to be like to enter that circle of giants as someone who was so young. And yet he has a beautiful metaphor for those five years. He said, during that time, fathers became brothers and brothers became friends. A wonderful, wonderful analogy of how the generations are supposed to adjust to each other. But then the lack of spiritual resources began to take their toll on young Beekner. He experienced a great deal of depression and someone suggested to him that he might go to the New York Avenue, <clears throat> the Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City, who one of the great preachers of your tradition, George Buttrick, was the senior minister. He said, you might go and listen to this man because he is uncommonly a bequeather of hope. And so young Beekner went, and he was enthralled with Dr. Buttrick's erudition, his eloquence. But even more significantly, there seemed to be a vitality from a world beyond the world's that streamed through that brilliant British preacher. Well, one Sunday, Buttrick, around the time that our president, the Persian queen was being, going through her coronation, he preached about how that Jesus had refused a crown that was offered him in the wilderness of temptation. But then Buttrick said, Jesus is in fact a kind of king because every time a human being allows Jesus to become their Lord, that is his true coronation. And then he said, such things always happen amid confession and tears and great laughter. And it was those last two words, great laughter, that triggered a genuine religious epiphany in the life of the young professor. He said, spiritually speaking, it was like the great China Wall came tumbling down and Atlantis came up out of the depths of the sea. Something from the world beyond the worlds moved through Dr. Buttrick into the heart of young Beekner, and he saw for the first time that to the mystery of Godness, Jesus gives a face, and on that face, a smile of everlasting mercy. He was so moved by this experience that he went the next week and made an appointment with Dr. Buttrick. And this wise old minister sensed the vast giftedness of the young professor, but also his tremendous God hunger. And so he suggested that Bigner might consider studying for a year at the Union Theological Seminary in New York. At that time, the Rockefeller Foundation was giving grants to young men like Bigner to explore the possibility of a vocation in ministry. And Dr. Buttrick was instrumental in getting one of those for, for Bigner. And so ironically, for a man who had probably never been in a church more than 20 times in his life, at the age of 27, found himself enrolling in a theological seminary. He said his family was absolutely flabbergasted. Nothing like this had ever been done by Beekner. In fact, his grandmother's friend took him to lunch one Sunday right after this and said, I understand you're thinking about going to the seminary. And he said, yes, ma'am. She said, is this your own idea or are you poorly advised? In other words, why would you want to do a thing like this? And many of his Princeton colleagues wondered about his emotional balance and were fearful that he was doing something terribly reactionary. But this young, bright, God-hungry human being with no baggage of preconceived, any kind of baggage of preconceived opinions, went to the seminary and under the tutelage of people like Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, James Meilenberg, he encountered for the first time the wonder of the great story that courses through Holy Scripture. He said he had seen excerpts of the Bible in courses in Western civilization, but never had he encountered the story in its entirety before. And he reports that he was astonished about two things. First, he found the Bible to be incredibly earthy, incredibly realistic, and ruthlessly honest. He was surprised to find that even its greatest heroes, like Abraham and Moses and David, 
were depicted as the flawed and failing human beings that they often are. No public relations spin given to Holy Scripture. But even more importantly, he said, what astonished him was a motif that he began to see always recurring in Holy Scripture. And it was that with this mysterious God, Yahweh, the worst things were never the last things. This God seemed to always have something up God's sleeve. This transcendent one was full of surprises. He reminded Buechner of the ancient alchemists who were always looking for a way to take lead and turn it into gold. And lo and behold, this image of an ingenious one who could transmute even the worst into something healing and something saving he saw this again and again and again, for is not that the deepest truth of the Christian vision, that the seemingly worst things in the economy of God are never the last things? God is never outmatched by evil, never overwhelmed by the destructive, always has a plan B and a plan C, when for reasons that are always full of mystery, plan, plan A simply disintegrates. You heard read just a few moments ago the climax of one of the great stories in the Old Testament where this motif is so obvious. Today we talk a lot about dysfunctional families. Well, Joseph in this story was born definitely into that kind of reality. His father Jacob had loved but one woman in all his life, his great beloved Rachel. But when they married for some reason, she could not bear children, which in that culture was a terrible, terrible blemish. And so again, according to the mores of that ancient time, other wives were brought in. And in the course of time, three different other women gave Jacob 10 sons. And then mysteriously, beloved Rachel was able to conceive and gave birth to Joseph, the 11th child chronologically, but the first child of the one who had the heart of Jacob. And when Rachel died giving birth to a second child, all of the affection, that Jacob had felt for beloved Rachel. He focused as his favorite on little Joseph. He gave him things he didn't give to the other 10. He didn't expect anything of him. It was a tragic condition of one who had known what it was to be the victim of favoritism when it came his time to be parent, simply did the same thing over and over again. H.G. Wells once observed very sadly, that the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history, that we let life be wasted on us. At any rate, the way Jacob chose to relate to Joseph created all kinds of problems. The 10 older brothers came to hate their father and hate this favored child. And Joseph, because he was pampered and spoiled, became absolutely insufferable. He was a little egotist that you could hardly bear to be around, thinking that he was a prince, who was at the very center of the universe. One of the things Jacob did was to give him a coat. In the Old Testament, it's called the coat of many colors, the King James. We know now better that it really meant in the Aramaic a coat with sleeves in it, which was a rarity in that day, the kind of thing that royalty would wear because royalty did not have to work. And so here is Joseph of being given this particular garment. The other sons are made to work. He's allowed to lounge around the house. And so one day when he's 17, the father, in great insensitivity, sends Joseph out to the fields to see how the working brothers are doing. And here they saw him coming in that hated leisure coat of his, and they literally exploded in rage. They first intended to kill him with their own hands, but then wise ahead said, wait, he's our own blood. And so they devised the plot of selling him to some Midianite traders that he might go and be a slave in Egypt they took that hated coat and dipped it in blood, went back and told their father he must have been killed by a wild animal. Everything about this story is simply soaked in human evil. There is something imperfect at every point. It seemed like, does it not, the worst that could possibly happen. Here's this hothouse plant who had never had to do anything but be doted on being sent down to be a, a slave in that inhuman culture of Egypt. It seemed like the worst of all possibilities. And yet, 
And yet this ingenious alchemist God was able to take the worst of things and bring the very best out of them. Because when Joseph got to Egypt, he was sold to a man named Potiphar. And for the first time in his life, he was given responsibility. Something was expected of him. He was put in a place of responsibility where he had to do something with the gifts that had been bequeathed to him. And in that structure, Joseph begins to emerge as a person of strength in ways he probably would never have emerged if he'd been left with his spoiling father back in his homeland. And so he becomes so productive that he rises to the very height of the household of Potiphar. And then Lady Potiphar is very much attracted to him sexually and tries to seduce him. And when he says very heroically, I am not eligible for that kind of relationship. My master has given everything under my control, but you, his wife, you are not something for whom I am eligible for that kind of relationship. In her frustration, she turned the tables, accused Joseph of doing what she herself had done. And lo and behold, he is knocked to the ground. Once again, life works him over. Now he's no longer a slave, but now he's in a royal prison. It seemed again as if the worst that could possibly happen. And yet our alchemist God is never outmatched by the destructive. Because there in prison, he did the one thing left to him to do was to serve. He became known as a skillful interpreter of dreams. And sometime later when the Pharaoh was being troubled by night torments, they remembered the Hebrew, they brought him to Pharaoh and he made so much sense of Pharaoh's dream that Pharaoh lifted him out of the dungeon and put him in the number two position of power. And Joseph was able to husband the great abundance of that particular era. And when a famine came later, Egypt became the breadbasket of the world and his family up there in Palestine heard of food. The brothers who had sold him into slavery came down. And as you know, there were many ins and outs, but finally Joseph reveals his identity. He says, God has used my being here under the worst, the worst of motivations. God has used this nonetheless to be saving and redemptive. And so he brings down the whole family. The descendants of Abraham are saved from starvation. And then after Jacob dies, as you heard read, Joseph's brothers remembering their guilt were cringing in fear as to what Joseph might do. But you come to that climax when they beg him for mercy and Joseph said, have no fear. You meant it for evil, but God used it for good. There you have what astonished Beekner that the worst things are never the last things in the economy of God. This God who wanted us to know God's kind of joy and therefore gave us freedom and gave us power and let us become participants in this drama of history. This God who had a sheer generosity wanted to share God's kind of joy and gave into our hands freedom and power and the minute God gave us freedom, God also ran the risk that we would not use our power lovingly, that we would not do with our potency what God had chosen to do with God's potency. My students this week asked me, where was God last Tuesday? Why didn't God stop those 19 maniacs from what they did in the air? And of course, the reason is that when God wanted to share God's kind of joy, God had to grant us freedom Otherwise, we could never have had a capacity for God's kind of joy. It is as if God once had all the power, and like a card dealer, he deals out power around the table so that now there's six billion of us that have the potency and the freedom to do something. So God is no longer the sole actor on the stage of history. Now all of us have some kind of potency to make a difference by what we do. But this God who has dealt around God's power so that we could taste something of God's joy, God has not left the game. He remains a part of this process that he is sharing with us. And when you ask, why did God give so much freedom? The only answer I can give is that he so wanted us to experience the joy that was God's alone. And freedom is an absolute ingredient that because he wanted us to know that kind of joy, he ran the risk of freedom 
And he also knew this ingenious kind of alchemy power that is God's, this ability to take bad things and somehow transmute them into healing and blessing. There is nothing beyond the ingenuity of the holy. Madeline Lengel has written a wonderful novel using a line from a 14th century mystic which says all the evil that humans have conceived or done is no more to the mercy of God than a live coal to the sea. If you'll think about the size of a live coal and think about the vastness of the ocean, then you get a proper proportion, a proper proportion of that which is evil and that which is good. St. Paul says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. God's goodness is bigger than our badness. God's power to redeem is greater than our power to sin. God, I think, gave us the freedom to do even the terrible things that we saw last Tuesday because God knows that in God's bottomless ingenuity, there are always ways to take the worst of things and find ways to bring goodness out of it. All of this, of course, is to say that this vision of God is the secret of hope. It's where you find the strength to face what today looks like a most uncertain future. I don't think we've ever in our culture been at a crossroads quite like this one. All kinds of dangerous possibilities because there are people out there with God's power doing things that God would never have done. It took three years to build one of those wonderful world towers and only three minutes to bring it down in destruction. Evil is the unmaking, the reversing of what it is that God is all about. But all the evil that humans have ever conceived or done is no more to the ingenious mercy of God than a live coal to the sea. Therefore, this morning, I bid you hope I bid you be alert to how God can use this situation in which we find ourselves to make us ever more conscious that what was done last Tuesday is not the way that God meant for us humans to be to and with each other. The destructiveness that we saw with horror is not the way that God wanted God's power to be used. And we all need to look at evil and to realize it and to strengthen our resolve not to live our lives this way, and at the same time to hope that this ingenious alchemist, who long ago took the evil that was done to Joseph and transmuted that into goodness, who took the worst thing we ever did to the best thing God ever sent us, Jesus Christ, crucified him, and then three days later raised him to the, back to life because the worst things are never the last things. God is never outmatched by evil. Always something up God's sleeve. Always some ingenious surprise to take the lead of evil and transmute it into the gold of good. I beg you to look to that one to get us through and to bring us out of this incredibly stronger and nobler and better because God's power to redeem evil is greater than evil's power to corrupt us and to hold that hope and to embrace that kind of deity, to believe the ingenious alchemist is our refuge and our strength, that, that is the secret of hope. And it's God's gift to us this morning. Winston Churchill obviously had picked up the same motif that Beekner found in Scripture. And the last two things he ever did publicly are both expressions of that profound faith. In June of 1965, by now a very old and weakened man, Churchill was asked to give the commencement address at a university in Middle England. He was badly infirm physically. They had to help him up to the podium, and he held on as if he was about to fall. Those that were there said there was this long silence as that doddering old man stood there, not sure that he would even have the strength to speak. 
But then they said he raised that head and that voice that had called England back from the brink years before made its last sound publicly because he looked out to that group and said, never, never give up, never give up. And with that, he turned around and took his seat. Everybody was stunned at first. They say it's the only graduation address in the history of man that can be remembered verbatim. But they stood up, they stood up as one person when they realized what he had done and they clapped because there was congruity between what the man said and what the man had experienced. If you know anything about Churchill, his career was pronounced dead again and again and again, and yet he continued, he continued like a phoenix to rise up because he believed the worst things are never the last things within this ingenious God of ours. Three months later in September, he died. And he had obviously known that this time was coming, and so he had left careful instructions about his burial, which was to take place in St. Paul's Cathedral, that magnificent building that inspired our own nation's capital. And those that were there said it was absolutely unforgettable as the great Anglican ritual unfolded, the scriptures were read, the hymns were sung. But then at the end, Churchill had asked that two special things take place. As his casket was being brought down that long aisle, he asked that a bugler be positioned on one side of the great dome. And as that sad procession made its way out, this bugler was to sound the tune of taps, that everlasting symbol that something has ended. Everybody there knew that an era had come to a conclusion. And they said they wanted a dry eye as those notes ricocheted back and forth, taps, is always the reminder that we've come to the end of something. But then when those notes had finally been sounded and faded, Churchill had asked that another bugler be positioned on the other side of the great dome. And that bugler was called on to blow reveille. It's time to get up, it's time to get up, it's time to get up in the morning. It was Churchill's way of saying that the worst things even death, given who God is, are not the last things. And this morning I invite you to leave this place, this holy, beautiful place, and let the sound of reveille be the sound of hope that rings in your ears. We are in a desperately, desperately difficult time, but there is only one God. Nothing else is as big and I'm betting my life on the fact that this worst thing is not going to be the last thing in the hands of the ingenious alchemists. Today, we're in the same place we were last Sunday, in the hands of this kind of God. Therefore, I bid you hope, hope in what God can yet do, can yet do to redeem us. Oh God, oh God, grant us hope, please.